Well, it's an emergency edition of PFTPM on a Tuesday afternoon. We are convening for one reason, but while I'm here, we may as well touch on a different story, a much different story, an entirely different story than why we decided to do this. And obviously we're doing this because Mike Vrabel has been fired by the Tennessee Titans, the head coach of the team, six seasons, number one seed a couple of years ago, PFT coach of the year in 2021. Not that that really matters, but he did get he did get a ham. He's the one that started this trend of us buying gifts for the people who win these awards, which I'm suspending this year, by the way. It got too damn expensive. The recognition alone is going to have to suffice. Unless and until Vrabel wins it again, then we will get him that ham. But first, he's got to get another job. And he shouldn't have any trouble. And this is a phrase that our friend Big Cat coined years ago when he was doing Fridays on PFT Live. Dysfunctional teams do dysfunctional things. Now, I may have come up with it before he was on PFT Live and said it, but as far as I'm concerned, that's the first time it was ever said. Because once I heard it, it's so perfect. It encapsulates what happens with some of these teams. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they're driving the organization off a cliff. They think they're right where they need to be. They don't do normal things. They don't do predictable things. They don't do rational things. And Amy Adams Strunk has been in charge of this team for a decade now. And I've leveled this criticism against guys like Jim Irsay. Your only qualification is you had the right DNA code to inherit the team when your parent, spouse, sibling, whoever died. In this case, it was Bud Adams, the founder of the Titans, died in 2013. And his own estate planning created a mess that simmered and almost boiled for years because he didn't direct which branch of his family tree, and there were three of them, would take control of the team. Split up the equity 33% each way, but no one was given control. And the NFL insists that every team have one person at all time who can cast votes on behalf of the franchise when it's time to vote on league matters. And they actually changed the rules in part because of the mess in Tennessee. You have to have a succession plan in place every year with one person named as the person who takes over if you die during the course of the upcoming year. So they don't have this situation again. Now, it didn't become as big of a mess as it could have been for the Titans. And Amy Adams Strunk emerged as the owner. But along the way, look what happened. Mike Munchak was fired at the end of the season that concluded the year that Bud Adams passed. Then came Ken Wisenhunt. A couple of years later, he's out. Then came Mike Malarkey. A couple of years later, he's out. They got it right with Mike Vrabel. They got a keeper with Mike Vrabel. He's 48. He's going to coach many more years into the future. And they should have found a way to keep him. They should have found a way to work with him. This gets back to the things I say about Jim Harbaugh. Shame on the 49ers for not making it work with Harbaugh because they would have won at least one Super Bowl championship between 2014 and now if they hadn't fired him. They called it a mutual parting, and he quickly said they fired him. So sometimes you don't realize what you have, and sometimes you're not willing to work with what you have because maybe the guy's a little too rough around the edges. And Vrabel has no patience for anyone who says anything other than what he believes. So maybe things got a little hectic. Maybe there were too many fights. Maybe there were too many squabbles. Maybe they're looking at Vrabel saying he can't get along with anyone. When the reality is Vrabel has been expected to work with front office personnel who don't see it the way he sees it and have bad ideas and make bad arguments and do things like draft quarterback Malik Willis when Vrabel seemed to not be all that interested in adding a quarterback at the time, specifically that quarterback at that time. Creating receiver A.J. Brown. We've played that video time and again of Vrabel getting up and stretching his neck out a little bit and trying not to blow a gasket when A.J. Brown got traded and they used that first-round pick for another receiver instead of just keeping the guy they had and paying the guy they had. And in hindsight, they clearly should have done that. So the Titans are taking a risk here that they're not going to find anyone better. And if it doesn't work out, they'll just fire the next one. If that doesn't work out, they'll fire the next one. But anytime you fire a coach, part of the analysis is, do I believe I am going to get someone better than the guy I have? And you can't come to that conclusion with any degree of certainty. If you're talking about rising coordinators, offensive or defensive, nobody knows what kind of coach they're going to be until they coach. They might be good. They might not be good. It's a completely different skill set. Completely different. 
How do you delegate? How do you deal with the media? How do you make big picture decisions? How do you handle yourself on the sideline during games? When it's time to go for two, when it's time to punt or go for it on fourth down, all the decisions you have to make with all the factors taken into consideration and listening to the analytics people telling you what you should do, at least based upon their models. Their models reach a point where reality has to take over. And it's the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom and the instincts of that coach have to make the decisions. When you have somebody who can do it, you better be sure you're going to get somebody else who can do it as well or preferably better. And unless they're going to get Jim Harbaugh, and even then, six and one, half a dozen of the other, I think they'd have been better off sticking with Vrabel. Unless they think they're going to get Bill Belichick. Six or one, half a dozen of the other. Well, Belichick, much more accomplished. But if you'd have given Mike Vrabel Tom Brady at age 22, who knows what the Titans would have done over the next 20 years. So, again, dysfunctional teams do dysfunctional things. And there's plenty of reason to look at the Titans and say this team is dysfunctional. As a football team, not as a business proposition, they finagled a bunch of free money to build a new stadium. Okay, as a business concern, Every NFL owner is a genius. They're all printing money. As a football operation, there are the owners who get it and the owners who don't. And the owners who get it like having 10 to 12 to 15 owners who don't, who make bad decisions, who are too quick to fire coaches, who don't value continuity and stability and just ricochet around from bad decision to bad decision to bad decision and wonder why. They can't get what they want. So that's my assessment of the Titans side of it. Now for Vrabel, look, I've said this Monday. I said it Tuesday. I'm going to say it again in case anybody out there hasn't heard it. July 4, one of the first emails I got that morning. Happy 4th of July. By the way, watch Mike Vrabel be the next coach of the Patriots. And it makes sense. And it's a hell of a year to make him part of the Patriots Hall of Fame. But it's bringing Mike Vrabel home. And – now that he's available, now that the Titans didn't play it out, that the Titans didn't exercise patience, the Titans didn't stand up to the circumstances, because even if Vrabel didn't come out and say, I want out, I mean, you can convey a lot of things without ever having the thought come out of your mouth. And Vrabel has that very demonstrative physique, just like I said earlier with the A.J. Brown thing, but he's got those long arms. And you know how he stands during games when he's like, I mean, he sends a lot of messages with his demeanor, his facial expressions, and his body language. So he never even had to say, I want out, for Amy Adams Strunk to get the sense, you know, this guy probably wants out. If he wants out, there's no point trying to make this work. And if he wants out and he wants out now, let's just be done with this. It's too hard to try to work this out, to try to finagle behind the scenes who our coach is going to be while we wait for the Patriots to call and then maybe get a first round pick or more for Mike Vrabel. It's going to be too difficult. We might step in something brown and smelly. And, you know, we got lucky with the whole ownership succession fiasco and the NFL could have made it a lot harder for us and they did it. Let's not test it. Let's not tempt them. Let's not give them any reason to say we did anything that we shouldn't have done because if you figure out who your next coach is going to be while you still have your current one, you're kind of violating the letter and spirit of the Rooney. If you've already made your decision before you even fire the guy you have, that's a problem. So my guess is Amy Adams Strunk just didn't have the stomach for what it would take to kind of, you know, hold the, the stick right on a, an airplane. Is it a stick like an old fighter jet? Like you got to hold the stick steady while you're going through some rocky times and you just kind of have faith, you're going to hold it steady through the wind and the rain and the hail and whatever else might tell it you're playing. She just didn't want to bother with it. Let's just move on. It's not worth it. Whatever we would have gotten on the other side, it's not worth the worry and the stress and the risk that it's going to blow up in our faces and make us look worse on the back end. So that's the Titan side. Right. Patriots. Makes sense. Now, my only hesitation is this. He's good friends with Bill Belichick, played for Bill Belichick. You know, if you've got a really great friend and that friend's got a girlfriend and the friend gets broken up with by the girlfriend, do you immediately swoop in? Don't you feel bad if you do that? Have you ever been in that situation? Well, whatever relationship you're talking about. But when you've got a good friend that's invested with a significant other and then that significant other says to your friend, 
get out of my face and you've got some sparks, you've got some chemistry. Do you swoop right in? Do you feel guilty about it when you do? I got to think at some level, Mike Vrabel feels guilty about the possibility of swooping in as the Patriots head coach with Bill Belichick getting fired, unless Belichick affirmatively says to him, do what you got to do. I'd rather you have it than somebody else. I'd rather you come take up the cause that I, that I have fought for 24 years. And I kind of had a weird idea earlier. Would there be a situation where Belichick could recruit Vrabel to come in as defensive coordinator, bring back Josh McDaniels as offensive coordinator, go to Robert Kraft and say, hire a GM. I'll go along with whatever decisions they make. I'll just coach whoever we have. I'll just cook the meal. Someone else can shop for the groceries to make a twist on the old Bill Parcells line. And I got Vrabel here and Vrabel takes over when I'm done. How about that? And I'll stay for three or four years. And then Vrabel's here and it's a smooth. Everybody's happy, and we all join hands, Kraft and Belichick and Vrabel, and we put our hands up like this, we take a bow, and then Vrabel. That would be cleaner, but it also delays by three years Vrabel's ability to coach the team. I'm just not sure he would be into that. Now, is that preferable to going and coaching another team? Because this is his chance to go coach the Patriots. You can't assume that the next time you're available, the Patriots' job is also going to be available. This is the moment if he's going to go coach the Patriots. So I think we have to watch that now. And, and who knows? Maybe the availability of Mike Vrabel and just at some level, the protectiveness that Bill Belichick might have, that he, maybe he deep down doesn't want Vrabel to come be the Patriots coach. Maybe that's what gets Belichick to say, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. Whatever you want. I just want to coach the team. Do whatever you want. You want to make changes? Make changes. You want to expand the staff? Expand the staff. You want me to trust people? I'll trust anybody you bring in here. But I want to stay as the coach. I'll do whatever I have to do to stay as the coach. I don't I, – I, I think that if Belichick was already going to bend, he would have bet by now. And I don't think the availability of Vrabel and the possibility that Vrabel takes over as coach of the Patriots after Belichick is going to be enough to get Belichick to bend. That's kind of the big mystery right now. Is there anything Belichick can do – to get Robert Kraft to not jump out of the plane. I've been using that metaphor or simile. I'm not sure which word is correct, but the idea of Kraft being in the plane and the plane goes up and he's got the parachute on and now he's at the door and is he going to jump? He's at the door. And Belichick is flying the plane, yelling back over his shoulder. Well, go ahead and do it. Go on, dumbass, and do it. That was a line from Christmas story. I think we're out of season, but still, those ideas kind of pop around in my brain from time to time. I just don't know that Kraft is going to do it. And the unexpected immediate availability of Vrabel is a factor that makes the Kraft Belichick Patriot situation a little more interesting. So interesting that, you know, I just got to check my phone and make sure that something hasn't happened in the past 15 minutes since we started this. All right. Now, since we're here, and I apologize for not asking for questions, I'll do that tomorrow, and I'll answer your questions about anything that's going on. Maybe I'll just do questions only tomorrow. If there's no other big development, I'll just let your questions guide my topics. But but before I came down, because I would have done this early, I had to hear what Aaron Rodgers had to say in response to Jimmy Kimmel's monologue last night. I'm not going to go through the whole history. If you've been paying attention, you know, and this is it in a nutshell, just in a nutshell. Last week, Rodgers gratuitously – suggests, implies that Jimmy Kimmel is on the Jeffrey Epstein client list because the way Rogers said it indicated that Jimmy Kimmel would be upset in some way once the list of his clients comes out. That's a given. He never specifically said Jimmy Kimmel's name is on the list. Never said that. Never said Jimmy Kimmel's a pedophile, but there's a lot implied when you say Jimmy Kimmel's going to be upset when the list comes out and I'm going to pop a bottle of something when it does. There's a history there between the two. That's established as well. So Jimmy Kimmel was very upset about what Aaron Rodgers said and said so on X, New Year's resolution, call it X, not Twitter X or whatever, just call it X, created a storm within ESPN, created a mess. Eventually ESPN issued a statement calling it a dumb and unfortunate joke. Monday night, Jimmy Kimmel came after Rogers aggressively in his monologue. And so today was the day Rogers addressed it. Now, look, 
I've been all over the place with Rodgers over the past 15 years. And as the season started, I was rooting for the guy. I was making myself like the guy. Hard knocks worked. I was willing to forget about all the stuff from the past. All the times he's been a conspiracy theorist, he's been disingenuous, he's been narcissistic, he's been manipulative. He's and, and this is kind of the way Kimmel put it last night. Just because you throw a football really well doesn't make you the smartest guy on the planet. And it doesn't imbue you with all sorts of special abilities that you can become the guy that everyone turns to no matter what the situation is. Just because you can throw a football really hard and really far and really long and really accurate. It doesn't make you a master of all things just because you're a master of throwing a football. So it's been a complicated relationship with PFT, me, and Aaron Rodgers. But yeah, as the season started, I was I was all in. I wanted to see it work. I wanted it to do, to do well. I was upset for him and for the Jets when the Achilles tendon tear happened. But, you know, unlike every other quarterback who suffers an early season injury, he didn't just go away and focus on rehab, recovery. Remember Tom Brady in 2008? Never heard a peep from him again for the rest of the season. Week one, after historic 18-1 season, undefeated, lost to the Giants, comebacks week one, comes back, comes back week one, gets hit low by Bernard Pollard, tears ACL, and he's gone. Rodgers kept doing McAfee show every Tuesday, and that's his prerogative. But it's continued to cause periodic, not all the time. He doesn't say something outlandish every week, but every once in a while he says something that, that attracts some attention and scrutiny. So last week with Kimmel, that made it a big mess. Kimmel came after. And today, and I've got it all taped. I've got it recorded. I've got it on my phone so I can go back and type it up if I want to. He never apologized to Jimmy Kimmel. And Kimmel said last night, I bet he won't. A decent person would, I bet he won't. But see, Rogers thinks he did nothing wrong. Rogers thinks he's the victim. Rogers thinks the woke establishment is coming after him now. And Rogers spent most of the 25 minutes or so relitigating the vaccination or no vaccination question from COVID. And he said a lot of things that he didn't back up with specific facts. And he said some things that we know are inaccurate. He suggested that the whole thing with the vaccine was it was going to stop transmission. Nobody ever said it was going to stop transmission. It keeps you from dying if you have risk factors, comorbidities that could cause you to develop COVID pneumonia and die. That was the whole point. Certain people desperately need it. Some people don't. Everyone should have made their own decision. Now, the idea that Rogers makes the decision for himself, that that's not the way to go, that's fine. But then when you become a crusader to try to convince others who might need it that they shouldn't get it, that's when it becomes problematic. And that's all I'm saying about it. My point is he spent 90% of the time talking about Kimmel, talking about COVID, because their beef goes back to the vaccination versus unvaccination question. Spent limited time on what he said last week, other than to say, I never said he's a pedophile. I never said he's on the list. No, but come on. This is just like when he said, yeah, I've been immunized. He plays these games with exact wording like a 14-year-old kid. That's what he does. And that's what pissed so many people off in late 2021. Once he got COVID and it came out, he hadn't been vaccinated that he lied about it. When he was specifically asked, are you vaccinated? He said, yeah, I've been immunized as part of this chess match to get a reporter to say, whoa, now, wait a minute. Oh, what does that mean? What does immunized mean? We asked you if you've been vaccinated. Is that the same? Is that different? And it was a gotcha game because nobody followed up. That's one of the reasons why people don't like his routine. Because people who mean well, people of goodwill, people who are fair and who reside in the world of common sense and trust with each other, don't play those games. We don't have to resort to these gotcha word games. So now, after he kind of flies a little close to the sun, when it comes to defaming Jimmy Kimmel, he's playing this game again. I never said he's a pedophile. I never said he's on the list. No, but he implied clearly that he's on the list. Jimmy Kimmel's going to be upset when the list comes out. Well, why would he be upset about it? So, anyway, it's just funny that a day ago, Rodgers was doing his pontification to all Jets players that next year they have to flush the bullshit and they have to focus only on things collectively and individually that lead to winning. 
And and I'm I'm not saying he shouldn't do McAfee's show. I remember when Ben Roethlisberger was doing a weekly radio spot in Pittsburgh. And every week he was saying something outlandish. Not every single week, but he was constantly. He'd say something that like calling out a teammate or complaining about this. It's like, you know, this is great for us, but it's not great for the Steelers. And eventually he stopped doing it. So if you're going to have a weekly platform, you just got to be careful what you say because you're going to create issues for your team. How does this not create issues for the Jets? Just think if the Jets were on their way to the playoffs and he said what he said last week, and this becomes a major distraction as we're trying to focus on a postseason game. So practice what you preach. Don't play word games. We're not 13 years old. And he seemed to be very sensitive about Aaron Rodgers challenging or excuse me, Jimmy Kimmel challenging his intellectual capacity. Very sensitive about that, which is fine. I mean, nobody likes to be called stupid or less intelligent than they think they are. But we'll, we'll, we'll run a clip of the whole thing. You can watch it for yourself. It just wasn't, I didn't know what I thought it was going to be. I didn't think it was going to be an apology. So it was that, no apology. But it wasn't the kind of burn it wasn't the kind of incisive analysis of the situation. It was just a lot of rambling, kind of like I'm doing now. But at least there may be something, you know, tying what I'm saying together. He was just all over the place with the whole relitigation of COVID. So it's kind of disappointing. I thought it was going to be a little spicier. I thought it was going to be a little more entertaining. I thought it was going to be more informative. And I thought it was going to finally put this whole thing to bed. Oh, and the one thing he did do that is going to be potentially problematic, he called out the ESPN executive who issued the statement saying that he made a dumb and inappropriate joke, if I'm quoting the statement correctly. He said that was a problem. This person did that. So this isn't done yet because ESPN may not appreciate that Aaron Rodgers isn't going along with the company's official assessment of what happened last week. That's the next step in this if there is one. So that's all I have to say. I'll let you get back to your afternoon or your evening or your morning if you're listening to this on Wednesday. If you are listening to it Wednesday morning, Get ready because Wednesday afternoon, an edition of PFTPM is coming. I will answer your questions and I'll cover any and all new headlines that may arise between now and then. And in the interim, PFT Live airs tomorrow, 7 a.m. Eastern on Peacock. Yes, the streaming service you must have this weekend if you're going to watch the Dolphins at the Chiefs, the first ever streamed NFL playoff game. If you want to see Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill and Tua Tonga Bailoa and everyone else on both of those teams and the two head coaches, you better get Peacock unless you live in Kansas City or Miami because there the game will be televised over the traditional three-letter network that has the arrangement to broadcast the game. That's it for now. See you tomorrow. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.